Now, I'd like to introduce the Identity Shield, protecting against the next wave of cyber threats, presented by our elite underwriter, Uber Ether. Awesome. Well, thank you. So um, I'm Matt Topper, president of Uber Ether. Uh, for the last 20 years, we've been building some of the federal government's largest identity and access management programs, as well as able to see a lot of the changes, uh, both for how attacks are happening within the federal government, as well as um, across the internet for some very large brands. Personally, I spent a lot of the start of my career on the darker side of gray hat hacking and um, kind of lived in a lot of the nefarious dark web worlds and how some of the things happen. And over the last two years, it's been an amazing pace of change um, for how coordinated and really automated some of these attacks have gotten, which has caused us at Uber Ether to take a new look at how we're protecting identities for our customers and really trying to get ahead of where we are today. So we're gonna spend some time looking at the evolution of identity threats and attacks, some of the emerging ways we're seeing um, these attacks happen and then what we're doing at Uber Ether to prevent them. So with that, we'll dive in. So really when we, started seeing attacks and identity vectors um, being used was first through viruses, um, right? We all remember the early 2000s where you'd click a Word doc and imagine uh, doing things on your behalf. Um, those a lot of times were deployed via phishing attacks. And as more and more data started to get leaked, the attackers were able to get much more targeted with those. So. Right, OPM hacked happened. We saw LinkedIn even grow up and your coworkers and peers starting to put their profiles on and what programs they looked in. And those that data would start getting scraped and you'd get a targeted message saying, hey, this is Joe from my home Gmail address. I'm trying to log into the AD server. Can you do this approval for me real quick? And right, that really wasn't Joe, that was some random account. And then most recently, ransomware. So we saw with the MGM attack last year, they broke in and then immediately pivoted to the synchronization servers that synchronize the on-premises active directories to their um, cloud providers directory and were able to sit there and grab all of the password changes as they were happening. Uh, and then from there, pivoted to really start moving laterally and encrypt across the network. So what we're starting to see today is a ton more reconnaissance. Um, with the amount of data that's been leaked, uh, not only from individual organizations, not only just username and password lists, but being able to correlate things. So news articles about what agencies and organizations are buying what software doing full IP scans of the entire internet with all the interfaces that are open and what software is running on those interfaces. I think we've all seen the rise in attacks against the firewall vendors lately. A zero day comes out, they don't even have to scan for those devices on the internet. They already know where they are to immediately take and use those exploits against those, which is why everyone's so challenged to pack so quickly. And then we're seeing those attacks being orchestrated. Um, the teams, there's teams that specialize in gaining footholds. There's teams that specialize in lateral movement to say, okay, you've got an account compromised. It's a normal user account. It's an administrative account. How do they will sell that access to somebody else that then can go find a foothold with a bigger exploit for bigger tools across the network? And then once they get their foothold into the big tools, they will turn that over to one of the ransomware groups that'll run their scripts to really run across your network and encrypt everything. So it's really amazing how many of these groups have turned into true businesses that are working together to grow their ecosystems and really get paid. And the most scary part is 
things like, I mean, we, we all hear the AI hype, but um, I spent about four hours one night with some of the data feeds I have and was able to correlate all of the employees on LinkedIn for a specific agency, took that, took their personal email addresses, pivoted that into voter registration records, pivoted that into Facebook scrapes of previous years, which gave me a lot of their home addresses, which then allowed me to pivot to their spouses or their partners or their children at those same addresses. And now, instead of having to attack the person with a corporate laptop, I can go after the other devices in their houses where we all know our kids are grabbing whatever game of the week and who knows where it really came from. So the AI generated exploits have given us a, an ability to really move and pivot across networks as well as home networks to find way more ways to target people um, to get access. So as I talked about, a lot of this is the multimodal attacks, um, also being able to AI generate content, AI generate those phishing emails based on doing net searches of products being purchased, that person's position, and then tailoring that to say, hey, this Cisco device or this Palo Alto service or this CrowdStrike endpoint, if they know you're in that, they can target those so, so closely. I can create a synthetic identity of everybody, anyone I want right now for about six bucks. If I have five pictures of you and 15 seconds of your voice, I can generate an entire AI um, image and video that will pass an online know your customer check. Um, and just as I said, with AI being able to generate code at scale today, the way it can, we've really lowered the bar for unsophisticated attackers to launch very sophisticated attacks. Um, and I will say uh, there's been some, yesterday there was a major release about some of the criticalities and vulnerabilities within all of the VPN software. So like I said, attackers are able to attack your home network. If they're able to take over your DHCP of your home router, right? they can redirect that network traffic before you even connect to the corporate VPN. Even if you boot your laptop up at home and your agency will connect to the VPN before you log in, they still have to reach out to DHCP to get that address. And then you've already been compromised. It's really getting quite crazy the number of ways that we can, or an attacker can take a look at you. So a little bit about identity and access management and why we are so heavily focused on this is the number one point to protect our networks and our people. So um, where we've really started to move to is around user behavior analytics. So the similar ways that someone like a Google might track you across the internet from a um, advertising perspective, we've developed, um, it's very similar to like a Google Analytics that'll go in and say, here's your login, here's your device settings, here's your operating system, here's your Chrome or your Safari that you use or Firefox. Um, what are your, where do you normally come from? What time of day do you log in? But moreover, we're also embedding um, JavaScript code into all of the pages of all the applications. So we can now start looking at the behavior of all your users and what pages do they go to from basically what is the path of pages people follow within the applications? On average, how long do they spend on those pages before they move on to the next one? It makes it very, very easy to find not even the needles in the haystack, but the needles in the needle stacks. Because now we can look at the exceptions to those patterns where things are moving faster than they should, or people are bypassing a page that is always in a flow. And as proof of that, um, we were working with a large quick service um, restaurant group that um, I'm pretty sure everyone here has eaten at one of their restaurants. But 
we started seeing a pattern where they had a corporate password reset. And because they've got all of these 15-year-old right, kids all the way up through corporate executives on a single um, Azure domain, um, they had their corporate password resets on the internet. And they took a, they couldn't handle all the phone calls. So they put on, okay, give me your first name, last name, email address, as well as an employee ID, which was good. And then once the person put in those things, it would send them a uh, duo push notification to approve to reset their own password. Well, we started seeing that they were bypassing that that duo screen was being bypassed by a certain subset of users, which should have never happened. But it turns out there was a bug in the code that the um, it wasn't us as the integrator that the integrator they brought in had. And now an attacker, all they had to do was first name, last name, email address, which we all know for most organizations is going to be a combination of first dot last, last first initial, but you pretty much find that for anyone on the internet. And then employee ID, they could just run the number million to figure out what that employee ID was. And as soon as they hit through automation, they were able to reset the password and they could have reset all the way up to the CIO and CEO of the corporation. Um, so we saw that happen, raised it to them and it was patched over a weekend. Um, we had found that it had happened about 43 times within two weeks. So it was actively being exploited. Yes, there's a lot of other ways that should have been caught. Um, we just had one part of the hooks into the system, but um, just proof that behavior analytics really, really works. And then from there, um, where we've started to go is, right, start using the exact same data the attackers are using. Start pulling in all of the compromises of the directories, compromises of the password lists, being able to pivot and say, okay, based on the HR records in an organization, this is the home addresses. These are where these people live. These are the other people in their household. This might be a privileged user on your network that has great history, but their kid keeps getting compromised every day. And we know that their home network um, is being used as a residential proxy for attackers today. Well, maybe we're just gonna ship, right? Not fire the person, but ship a dedicated device to their house that their laptop now sits behind. That is beyond what they're doing on their own network or their home network. Um, being able to really identify the risk of the users, the people they interact with, the environments they work within, as well as when they're coming in from IP addresses, going out and really understanding the risk of the IPs they're coming from, the history. If they're coming from a brand new domain that just got registered, well, maybe that's a registered domain that is replacing an L with a one or an I, and they're now phishing against us. Um, We've automated a lot of these capabilities that at login time, we can start looking at the risk of the people as well. It's getting important for things like federating between agencies and federating between companies where we don't necessarily know who's coming from our partners ahead of time. Um, we started implementing a lot of these type of capabilities within the DHS Homeland Security Information Network when we ran those programs and were quite successful in being able to tell other agencies when they were compromised before they had even seen it themselves. So to wrap up before we get into some questions today and please send in the questions because I much prefer that side of helping people than just spitting at y'all. Um, the PIV and password are not good enough anymore. We have to move beyond just a credential or a single credential to identify the risk on our users and their behaviors on our networks. Move beyond just those single binary things to looking at more of the posture of the devices they're using, the consistency of the devices they're using, 
right? That's great. We've got a PIV card that we can plug into any device, but have I seen you use that device before? And if not, I might want to identity proof you even more strongly or look more into your behavior and analytics and put you, we call it a jail, but in a limited access group until we know that you're really behaving the way you do and asking for applications you want instead of letting a bot run wild across the network. Um, a lot of the security measures and identity that have been put in the past are reactive. A, oh shoot, this looks bad, kill the session. Oh shoot, this looks bad. Hopefully the SOC team has enough time to look at this issue and get it up before the adversary starts moving across the network. We really have to start moving towards predictive, which is where a lot of user behavior analytics and some of the risk tools we've built have gone to. Additionally, we've in general started to take a very lackadaisical approach in our firewall rules within agencies, allowing lateral movement to happen once an attacker is inside. We have to get back to explicit policies between what applications can talk to each other, as well as mutual TLS. I know it's hard, I know it's difficult, but over the last three years, there's been a ton of change to that, giving us an ability to um, really deploy those out at scale, at speed, without affecting the underlying code, and really not changing anything about the deployment patterns or the effort to deploy things um, within the networks. So with that, um, the identity is changing. As we know, all of the zero trust movements have really allowed us to take a better look at how we're protecting our users, our applications, our networks, and most importantly, underneath all, all of it, our data. Um, don't immediately assume that the patterns of the past are the ones we have to repeat in the future. Um, there's a lot of opportunity here to build the synergy between the tools and applications um, in a open and standards-based way that doesn't tie you into a single vendor, but does give all of the tools across the Zero Trust pillars um, an ability to use that information openly to drive really enhanced security across the board. So with that um, organization that is more than happy to have those discussions, have the, what have we seen at scale in the commercial world? What have we seen within the um, government agencies we support from civilian to DOD up into the IC and the different attacks on the different networks and approaches that are happening. Um, and I think if we dig in, we've got some pretty amazing ways to help you protect your organizations. So with that, um, if there's any questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat. Well, thank you, Matt. I don't see any questions in the chat, um, but I, I'll pitch you a question if you if you don't mind. Um, one of the things we see frequently, um, you know, covering public sector Absolutely. is um, is the uh, that people's identity and credential access uh, outlasts their term of employment, whether as a federal employee or a contractor. And what can automation do to kind of reduce the the lag? between, you know, people's leaving a company and their, and, or, or, or changing their status and having their uh, access following, you know, at their access, either locked out or altered to, uh, to accommodate that. Yeah, that's honestly a great question. One that we see all the time. Um, one of the things we found uh, working at DHS is right. You've got the payroll system. Uh, through OMB, and then you've got the HR system that's run by uh, DHS. Well, DHS was really good about um, getting the people on board and online, but they wouldn't update their HR system when they left because, well, they just went to the payroll system to make sure they stopped getting paid. 
So once we found some of those issues and were able to start pulling in the payroll feeds on a multiple time a day basis, able to tick those things off, as well as um, we've used some of the identity governance tools in our platform to look at things like, hey, this person hasn't logged in in 30 days. Remind their manager if they're still here. Hey, every quarter, all of the contractors that are assigned to this contract, the core needs to reattest that they're still here. And right, a lot of times on a large scale contract, they don't even know who those people are. So give them an ability to delegate to the program leads from the agencies. Um, and those are some of the more traditional approaches, things we've seen more recently. And I think this is going to increase as CMMC and some of the critical infrastructure changes uh, between the DOD and CISA are coming out is federating back to their home organizations. So a lot of times, right, if a contractor lays off a person or the person moves on to a new opportunity, they'll forget to shut things off timely. And we've had agencies where those people work in procurement and now work for a different company and still have access to the procurement systems, which gets really dangerous. Um, and magically people start winning more contracts than they have in the past. But if we federate back to the home organization and say every morning when you start your day, you have to go back to at Uber Ether, authenticate there, and you still might have to come back and authenticate with your PIV or your phishing resistant credential at the agency border. But those companies are much better at turning off their own employees access than they are telling the government about it. So that federation pattern has really made a change in the ability for agencies to stay on top of who is and still who is still and isn't employed. So just some of the patterns we've seen emerge more recently um, that have actually paid really strong results. Yeah, I mean, thanks for thanks for that answer. I mean, I think that, you know, government um, and it's, you know, push to do things like payroll as a, as a shared service uh, may, may, may be neglecting some of those sort of communications back and forth between the home agency and the shared services agency uh, for the purposes of cybersecurity and probably something that needs to be revisited in this day and age where, you know, threats are, are everywhere. But uh, thank you so much, Matt, for that presentation. And thanks to Uber Ether for being our underwriter.